I finished the Mushoku Tensei light novel 8 months ago and, ever since, it's been living in my head, rent free. I love so many things about this story. Rotepi is a brilliantly detailed world, phenomenal plot, colorful and interesting cast of characters, and most importantly, its protagonist. Many things in combination contribute to what makes this series the best piece of media I've ever consumed. To me, on a deep personal level, Mushoku Tensei is more than just fiction. It's my favorite thing humanity has ever made. It may seem like a massive L to some, but Mushoku Tensei changed the course of my life. The amount of flaws I have is uncountable and I hate it. The amount of flaws Rudy had made him unbearable to some. But when I see how he changed, overcame obstacles and went from a shitty neat to a respectable warrior, it, it made me feel urgency. Urgency and necessity to be active, to do things because life is fleeting by nature. It's just so easy to not act in the present, only to then hate yourself for allowing so much time to pass without achieving anything. The ending of Mushoku Tensei, without spoilers, embodies my biggest fears, worries, and regrets. It's a beautiful ending filled with so much love. You can feel Rifuji Nagamoto's affection for his series and you can feel it so strongly, up to the final period on the final sentence. The ending was so profound that it not only allowed Mushoku Tensei to cement itself as an unforgettable story, but it also allowed the series to represent my aspirations along with my greatest fears, and Rudeus Greyrat is at the epicenter of all of it. Despite its many controversies, I love and appreciate Mushoku Tensei greatly. Nagamote made a once-in-a-lifetime story, and if you yourself even slightly feel the same towards this series, and if you are intrigued with the life lessons provided through Rudy, then I welcome you to the character evolution of Rudius Greyrat. Rudy in his past life achieved nothing, did nothing, was nothing, and changed nothing. His mother and father just died, but instead of going down to their funerals, he decided it was a good idea to start an edging session to a hentai game. His family over the years tried to help him go through his trauma, but he didn't care enough to listen. He had a long life ahead of him, but instead of taking care of it, he ended up spending it in this locked up box. He became a cancer on this family, a tumor, and Ultimately, his siblings decided to cut him out of their family. Now Rudius doesn't even have his hentai game, so he is as low as a human can possibly be. But just then, at his lowest, a first spark of redemption appears. Truck-kun is on fast track to doing truck-kun things as he is about to kick off a mid-tier isekai with Nanahoshi as the MC. But for some reason, Rudy intervenes. He, for the first time in years, takes the initiative and tries to make a difference for, well, no one knows why. Why did he risk his life? Maybe he saw how he ended up. He saw how his life was over, and he didn't want these high schoolers to end up dead as well. So he leapt forth to save them, but the next thing you know, he just ends up on the ground, in a puddle of his own blood. The other's fate is unknown, but one thing is for certain. Rudy is about to die. The Grim Reaper is about to embrace him with its icy cold grip, but instead of an afterlife, he gets a second chance. Many people in their lives wish to start over, to have a second chance and make things better. We humans are stupid, we make a lot of mistakes, but we all believe that if we could just turn back time, we would actually go through with the 3am motivational plans. Marcus Aurelius, a Roman general and military genius, stated, Think of yourself as dead. You have lived your life. Now take what's left and live it properly. This just goes to show how deeply intrinsic the feeling of lost potential is in the human condition. But before this video becomes a PewDiePie philosophy talk, also known as the best content on YouTube, we gotta go back to Rudy. Because whilst our collective feelings aren't that different from his, his circumstances most certainly are, as Rudy actually gets his second chance. He just died. It looked painful. It was not pleasant. He will never see anyone he ever knew again. So with all of those things being still fresh in his mind, what do you think is the first thing he does in his new world? He decides to press E to interact with his mother's boobs, cause of course he does. Oh boy, this guy has a long road ahead of him. 
Rudy's early years can be chalked up to him being very, very creepy as he harasses Lily on a daily basis. This shit got so bad that whenever Lily looked at Rudy's face, she low-key got reminded of a perverted noble. In the light novel, I believe she thought Rudy was pos- In the light novel, Lily thought Rudy was possessed. <laughs> Aside from the life sentence worthy El Riz, in this new life, Rudy starts to immediately show his positive developments. The moment he is born, aside from the whole, uh, you know, Rudy spends his days being productive as he explores the world around him and tries to learn as much as possible as soon as possible. A kid's brain is like a sponge. Compared to adults, it's capable of learning and taking in information faster, which is why it's easier for them to learn the languages. For Mushoku Tensei, this phenomena is paralleled with the learning of incantationless magic and being able to bolster your mana pool at an early age. I don't know if this was an intentional line drawn by Nagamote, but it reminds me of how talentless I am now. Me watching Cartoon Network when I was growing up is the only reason I know English, despite me choking on my own tongue trying to read this shit. My retarded ass can't learn anything anymore. <laughs> Rudy surprisingly uses his early years wisely, and he starts to learn how to read, write, and most importantly, he learns magic. He spends many years learning magic and expanding his mana pool. It was hard, it was arduous and grueling and tedious, but he practices discipline. He dedicated many hours every single day for years, and ultimately, he became a saint-level water mage. This massive achievement is an example of his newfound will, which shows Rudy's fast development and positive traits like commitment and dedication becoming a no-brainer to him now. Meanwhile, this fat fuck wouldn't have gone up to take a shit to save his life. Positive traits are already starting to shine within Rudy. He is actually serious about living this time, and there is no way in hell he would ever allow this priceless second life to go to waste. In episode 1, didn't you find it odd that Rudy wasn't able to shout or speak out properly? If he screamed here, he would have saved these students. If he talked here instead of growling, he wouldn't have been beaten up. Okay, he still definitely would have been beaten up. But the point is, Rudy essentially lost all possible social skills and the ability to properly communicate. He barely talked to anyone for over 20 years and spends his days in a box, mentally and physically stagnating. He's like the final boss of introverts, but with the arrival of Roxy, his social interactions and perspective of the outside world changes. He finally touches grass. Roxy becomes the first person Rudy looks up to and respects. Sure, Rudy had Paul, but uh, yeesh, yeah. Roxy changes Rudy in many ways, but the most important thing she does for now is taking him outside and opening up a whole new world for him. I don't know though, he probably would have preferred this world to open up, but besides that, the final test allows Rudy to overcome one of his biggest insecurities. Arguably, this is the single most defining moment in the story. Without Roxy appearing here, Rudy probably wouldn't have met Sylphie, Eris, and set the entire story into motion. Roxy gives Rudy courage, power, guidance, and these traits will become invaluable in the future. This episode, nearly effortlessly and with minimal exposition and dialogue, sets up half of Rudy and Roxy's character arcs which will happen many, many episodes from now. It's just kinda insane to think about how much attention to detail Nagamote puts in every single one of his pages. And speaking of attention and love, you can't have RGB without the G! Sylphie! The future first wife of Rudeus! If you do not like Eris, I understand. If you do not like Roxy, I understand far less. But if you do not like Sylphie... While Sylphie doesn't play a major role in Rudy's emotional development at this stage, she still has a large role to play in shaping Rudy's future. Sylphie was Rudy's first friend. He saves her from bullies and doesn't mistreat her just because of her hair color. They continue to spend a lot of time together as Rudy even teaches her silent casting. Sylphie sees these actions as priceless gifts, whilst to Rudy is nothing special, but he still walks away from this relationship with a major change in character. He develops a proper objective to work towards. He dedicates himself to obtaining enough money to afford a tuition for himself and Sylphie. In his previous life, Rudy would demand food, lodging, and silence. He would even have the audacity to get mad at his parents whenever they were too loud. But here, when Paul explains that affording two tuitions is impossible, Rudy understands this, and instead of crashing out or being selfish, he decides to take up a job. He wants something, thus he will work to get it. In his previous life, getting out of his fucking room would have been impossible, let alone getting a job. So this is a major change in his personal development. 
So much for jobless reincarnation, huh? When it comes to personal development in the Grey Rat Zoo Park, not much happens. We just find out that Rudy, just like any other sensible human, finds these creatures very cute. And just like any other sensible human, finds this creature infuriating. Okay, never mind. His positive development here mostly centers around the testing of his determination and patience, as he has to deal with this wild dog. So the real kicker happens outside of this Chinese zoo. Rudy and Eris get kidnapped. At first, Rudy thought this was some shenanigans made up by Philip, but then he realizes just how much of a serious situation he found himself. When Eris woke up, she of course went batshit insane and started yelling, and as a result, she drew out the wrath of one of these bandits. By the time he was done with her, she was on the ground, barely breathing and barely conscious. Only thing she could say is to just threaten them with her own grandfather. Meanwhile, this fucking asshole just stood around and said nothing. He could have easily just shattered this guy's spine with a few rocks, but nope, he just watched him beat Eris up like it was nothing. He even waited for his own turn. This just goes to show how little he actually cares about Eris. He was not willing to actually do anything to protect her. He is there solely for the purposes of getting his coin and then studying at Renoa. That's it. That's where this entire relationship ends. But when he sees how battered and bruised Eris is, he feels bad about it. He just can't stand it almost, and decides to heal her and put her under his wing. For a decent time, Rudy didn't even look at his new world as another reality. He looked at it as a video game, a world that centers around a bright-hearted, talented young chap. But this scene serves as a rude awakening. After nearly dying himself, he sees a man get decapitated right in front of him. He sees death for the first time and subsequently, this makes Rudy realize that not everything will go his way. This is the second instance when Rudy was being hesitant to do any real damage to another human. He doesn't want to kill people or hurt them because he doesn't want that responsibility to weigh down on his neck. And as a result, he's partially responsible for why Eris was so damaged, and this time, he almost died for it. Rudy was a few seconds away from ending up like that guy, and it makes him understand that not everything is sunshine and touching women inappropriately, creepy fuck. Like After this point, Rudy starts to take this world a bit more seriously. He no longer decides to do the bare minimum that is required of him, and it becomes a bit less Horny? Okay, n never mind. No, the benchmark is so low that becoming less horny means fucking nothing. But when it comes to him going the extra mile though, that actually does apply, especially to his relationship with Eris. Despite being treated badly, beaten, battered, verbally abused, and almost dragged into a political war, Woody somehow manages to mature in this environment and starts to actually care about this mad dog. He no longer looks at the relationship he has with Eris as just transactional. He does things that were never asked for him to do in the hopes of helping Eris, lifting her back up. First it was when he defended her against the bandits, and second is when Rudy defended her against the nobles. Rudy didn't care, but this is the point where their relationship starts to blossom into something beautiful almost. Rudy never planned for any of this to happen, he just wanted some money, but he ended up starting off a relationship which will carry on to the rest of his life. Very touching, I know, but have you heard of a hit game called Portal? Fancy. Fancy, fancy, no the teleportation incident. This marks the first turning point of our journey, as Rudy's whole life turns upside down. He, along with Eris, is teleported to the Demon Continent, the most dangerous ecosystem in the world. This place is filled with monsters of all varieties, which inhabit inhospitable sands. In the day, the environment is pummeled by heat, and the night it is choked by frost. Your only food source here is monster flesh, which also doubles as firewoods for some fucking reason. And then I decided to research about flammable food and I found out that McDonald's, after a little bit of tinkering, is allegedly very fucking flammable. Despite Rudy's talent for magic and Eris's aptitude for the sword, both of them would have most likely perished here if they didn't meet their guardian angel. Ruijard Superdi of the Superd tribe. This man is so fucking sick, and so is his design. Surely the story won't demand it to change in the future, right? <laughs> Please, I want to cosplay as a Oh no! All his life, Rudy was told that Superds were baby eating monsters, but he soon finds out that Ruiger is just a teddy bear. But I. Uh, still a bear, I, I guess. After establishing that he won't eat their souls, Rudy, Eris, and Ruiger go on to visit Roxy's home. And here, we uncover Ruiger's tragic past. 
Lapless, the wicked demon god, deceived and betrayed all of the Superds, tainting their name and instilling prejudice in the world. The situation got so bad to the point where Ruidrid, along with other Superds, started to massacre each other and their own families. Ruidrid himself ended up killing his family, and ultimately, the entire race got exiled off of the demon continent. Ruidrid now dedicates himself to fixing this Superd tribe's reputation, but so far, it was to no avail. Upon hearing this, Rudy and Ruidrid start to develop an interesting relationship. A relationship which will dictate a lot of Rudy's actions in the future. But as of now, it only gives him a secondary objective. Initially, Rudy's primary objective was to study at Renoa with Sylphie, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't even utter her name even a single time until he meets Paul. So, that plan goes out the fucking window. His new first objective is to bring Eris back home to the central continent, whilst the secondary objective is to help Ruidrid. On one hand, this reveals how Rudy wants to push his new life to the limit by fulfilling all the side quests, but interestingly enough, this shows how Rudy is quick to move on to the next thing that is in front of him. Rudy is not a dumb guy, yet he doesn't even properly connect the dots about how other family members and friends could have teleported to the demon continent. He doesn't mention anything from Fatoa, not his family, not his friends, not his home, absolutely nothing for the rest of the demon continent journey. It's as if for Rudy, nothing exists right now except for Eris. This is obviously very neglectful and cruel of him, but it's the sad reality. A reality which you will regret very, very soon. The three musketeers create a party named Dead End in order to gain metal scrap, which is the currency of this continent. So essentially they're just using the Russian ruble. How much is it? An actual shitcoin. Rudy and the gang don't want to go around making McDonald's wage for catching random demon cats all day. So they decide to swap jobs with other adventurers, and they just end up getting this poor bloke killed. Richard kills this guy without any thought, and Rudy here expresses his disdain for killing. He is strictly against it no matter the situation and scolds Richard. Despite Rudy's size, both mentally and physically, he thinks it's in a very black and white tone. The best way I can sum it up is, do no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, be above 18 so I don't consider you a child, or I will fucking spear you to death. It's not that hard to see why Rudy is against murder. He grew up in Japan, so he has a somewhat functional moral compass, but he doesn't truly grasp the unsure, unfamiliar, nuanced, and yet random reality of this world. He doesn't really understand just how unfair this place is, and, well, he's gonna find that out exactly through his own actions. Rudy decides to take up a S-ranking job of killing a Dark Souls boss. There are two other parties on this job, but if they just team up, they can all walk away with a boatload of cash. Rudy gets an adventurer killed for no justifiable reason. He doesn't allow Ruiger to intervene, so he gets this Sesame Street character killed. Rudy was planning to swoop in at the last second to save this party, to paint himself in a heroic and glorified manner. But as we mentioned, this world is spontaneous, unfair. It's the real world, and people die. Rudy wasn't expecting for another adventurer to die so easily. This was almost a shock to him. Up until now, I think Rudy never even realized just how fortunate he is to not only have boundless mana, but also to have Ruidrid accompany him. As a result, Rudy ended up projecting his own capabilities and potential onto the common adventurer, and it caused someone to die. Rudy hasn't fully learned his lesson yet. You'd imagine that after such a conversation and seeing multiple people die right in front of him, Rudy would be more mindful about that and understand that this life isn't a game. But he doesn't. This brings us to one point that I don't see any media capture properly. This point I'm gonna talk about right now is probably one of the most important and the best things Rifuji Nagamote ever wrote in Mushoku Tensei, and that is character development. In most stories, character development is written in two major ways. First and the most boring is a time skip. It's pretty fucking self-explanatory. But the second one is the most cliche way to develop a character. The protagonist undergoes a singular, significant moment, which instantly causes a substantial and permanent change. The worst case of this is when episodes bring us an inner conflict, which gets tackled during that singular runtime, and by the end of it, they change the characters' minds completely. The way they think, the way they act, they learn a lesson and they just move on. It's fucking corny bullshit! That's not how people work! But in Mushoku Tensei, this doesn't happen. In Mushoku Tensei, development is a process. Just because you had one moment of realization, one moment of motivation to change, and one moment which forces you to change, doesn't mean that it will actually stick. That development lingers on. It takes not only time with many, many steps to properly establish this change in your mind, but it's also tragically easily revertible. Development here is handled with extreme care and realism. 
It shows you its true struggle, and this is what I find to be so relatable about Mushoku Tensei. We've all had that 3am motivational boost, right? I have at least, and to a deplorable degree. At night, due to my lack of progress during the day, I had to tell myself I could have done better, I could have achieved more. I tell myself so many times with shrill conviction every single night that I would be better, only for nothing to really change. You feel motivation only when you feel regret, and you feel regret when it's too late. I'm positive everyone at some point felt like this, and this is one of my favorite and most respectable aspects of Rudius Greyrat. For him, change is a struggle. He goes through so much in a story and it slowly molds him into a better person, sometimes even into a worse person. Thankfully for all of us though, this next struggle actually turns him into a better person. Don't, don't get your hopes up, it, it doesn't make him less horny. That shit is still like a season away. Up to this point, Rudy was the sole head honcho of Dead End. Whilst he did look at Eris and Rui as close friends, he would barely even take their words into consideration when planning. He was the single-minded leader of the group, and this caused his first major fuck-up. As a result, Rui, Jordan, and Eris ask Rudy to rely on them more. They see that Rui can't handle everything alone, mentally or physically. They see how Rudy struggles when it comes to making the truly right decision, and Rui Jordan wants Rudy to rely on him. He would imagine that such a blunder would change you, especially after your friends call you out on it like this. But unfortunately, every single word Richard says falls on deaf ears. Despite Rudy really continuously pressing Rui to stop killing so casually, he, for the first time, was contemplating killing someone to achieve his desired outcome. The death of this Sesame Street character didn't exactly nudge Rudy in the direction of Oh, let's not kill no matter what. If anything, it kind of shattered that fantasy entirely. It's not like he'll just go on a killing spree now, but now he sees killing as the awful but necessary option, especially if his closest friends are put in danger. Wojak Horseman decides to blackmail Rudy with the promise of exposing his illegal job trading. This would not only cause a lot of headache for the crew, but it would also put Eris in serious danger. So, for the first time in his life, Rudius Greyrat seriously considers murdering someone or causing mass-scale collateral damage just to escape. Previously, he would have bent over backwards to appease this cheap salami, but here, the circumstances are very different. This involves people he actually loves, and well, he's… he's not about to take any of that bullshit. This entire experience matured him. It made him understand that there are people who can't be reasoned with. Sometimes a battle of will will come down to bloodshed, and even a rat will fight when its back is cornered. Okay, this might be some edgy cool stuff in development, but the most important part here is him understanding just how much Eris means to him. Rudy in this moment was ready to level an entire city. He would never have even considered this serious option if he was alone, but this just goes to show how attached he has become to Eris. Rudy in this moment tries his best to steal his resolve, and thankfully, Richard sees everything clearly. As much as I would love to talk about this entire situation wholeheartedly, go on and say how Rudy changed and developed in the face of Ruijer who acknowledged him as a true warrior, this scene means fucking nothing. Everything discussed here kind of falls on deaf ears the moment Rudy has a hard time with something, anything really, and it's kind of sad. In my original revision of this script, I described this scene as something worthwhile, something that really affected Rudy. The thing is, it doesn't. Even he says it in this exact same scene. He says that he will never have the same pride as Richard, and he just feels a slight giddy about the situation, about being respected. It never cut deep. It's never once cut deep in Rudy's being, and it's kinda sad, because the following scene kinda proves it. Rudy here seems like he actually changed. Rudy here seems like he's actually going to consider what Ruijer and Eris think and how his actions will affect them. He's actually gonna take into consideration their feelings on their journey. But the thing is, he doesn't. A few months later, when they arrive at a port city, Rudy decides to once again take the entire situation in his hands. He decides to sell his own staff for the sake of obtaining a bit more money to get on the ship. He doesn't consider what Eris and Ruijer have to say about this. He doesn't even ask them about their own input on this topic. He just decides to once again be the sole leader of Dead End as he completely neglects both of them. At the end of the day, he is doing this out of selfless desire of getting the situation done and over with, but at the same time he is selfish and he's a liar. He promised both of them that he would actually have meetings for Dead End to discuss their futures. But he doesn't do that. 
Bruiger even calls him out on this and says that even after all this time, even after everything they discussed, is Ruiger truly that useless? That unreliable? And it kinda hurts, man. Despite having such a brilliant scene with Ruiger and Eris, Rudy hasn't changed. This is the example of a development we discussed. Just because you had one really cool scene with someone doesn't mean you're fucking changed. And this proves it once again. Rudy fundamentally has a hard time changing and developing. His development, or how deep it really got to him, is tested through tough situations. He only changes after he sees how much he has hurt Ruijert, and how much he will hurt Eris if he actually sold the staff and ended up fully and utterly lying to both of them. That's the only thing that really convinces him to change. Tough choices and tough situations are the only things that really get through Rudius. These shiny glamorous moments of heartfelt conversations don't actually do anything. These scenes do. When he disappoints someone, when he hurts someone, that's what really gets through to him. That's what really changes him. Well, this arc doesn't quite change Rudy, it more or less serves as a payoff to some of the major developments in the previous episodes. First of which is when Rudy allows Ruiger to kill dozens of, well, calling these monsters humans isn't the right word. But this moment sort of pays off Rudy's newfound understanding that killing is sometimes necessary, if not obligatory. Let's skip it forward a little bit and here we are! Millis, baby! The best looking city which is also just fucking ass. Two years after the teleportation incident, in the holy country of Millis, Rudy finally meets up with his father. Unfortunately, a lot of things changed in that time. Paul is no longer that cheating scum, but <coughs> I mean, cheerful, horny yet lost father. He is a decrepit, depressed, drunken bum. Paul has been rotting in booze, coping with the whole teleportation aftermath. Meanwhile, Rudy just pops up, looking as bright and cheerful as ever like nothing happened. All this time though, Paul was struggling, lamenting at his own inability to find his own family, and this sparks a conflicting emotion inside Paul. On one hand, Paul is grateful that his one and only son is alive and well, but on the other hand, it makes him jealous, disappointed, upset, it's hard to pinpoint. But Paul is definitely not pleased, because while Rudy was adventuring, Paul was here, dealing with their family's loss. The following talk between Rudy and his father reveals the true extent of just how neglectful Rudy was towards not only his family, but towards everyone he ever knew. He didn't really think about anything aside from getting Eris back home. He didn't think or even worry for a second about his family. He barely even acknowledged this as a proper disaster. His views and thoughts never went beyond Eris, and this just goes to show just how grotesquely uncaring and nonchalant he is about the entire situation. I mean, imagine yourself like this. Someone you know just got teleported, and then you get teleported. You would at least connect the dots and be like, oh shit, if I got teleported here, maybe someone else also got teleported. Let me just at least ask around and find some information. Maybe we can gather some people. But nope, Rudy does not alter a single fucking peep. During the demon continent journey, Rudy develops in many different ways, but he regressed in others as well, most notable of which is his familial love. Despite being very little, it slowly and obviously decayed away. Whilst we did establish that Rudy would start going the extra mile for things, we also established that major development and change does not cement itself in a single moment. Rudy in his past life made many, many mistakes. He even similarly mistreated and neglected his family. Yet in this new life, he doesn't even acknowledge this as a major flaw. Despite living without regrets being his sole objective, he makes massive mistakes and has a hard time changing. And the best example of this is when he doesn't even see his major familial flaws. For Christ's sake, when Rudy sees Paul, the first person he mentions is Silphy. Not even his mother or sisters or Lilia. Silphy. Brother! Brother, ugh. Rudy's entire development gets challenged here. We get a grasp of how deeply these changes cemented themselves, and from the looks of things, they aren't that deep. Sorry G, did you also think that you could run away from PTSD and trauma? Unlucky, it's gonna take more years than that, boy! Both Paul and Rudy are similar in this aspect. Paul thought he learned to treat his son better, to give him the benefit of doubt and understand his perspective. After all, he did have this awful scene with Rudy a few years ago, but I guess he didn't. After this scene, Paul does cool down and starts to take into account Rudy's journey. Paul acknowledges that Rudy surviving the demon continent requires praise and not scorning. His one and only son is with him alive and well. And whilst we know exactly how flawed Rudy is, Paul needs to see Rudy as what he is, a kid. 
not a hero. After this scene, Paul doesn't become the father of the year, not by a fucking long shot. But the following scene of just Paul lamenting of his flaws is just heartbreaking, man. He's a flawed human, he's a flawed character, and ultimately deep down, he's a good person. He's just a heartbroken man dealing with the entire world's weight. To me, Paul's flaws is what makes him such a brilliant character. His strengths and perseverance to get through it all no matter the solution and then just failing, trying to cope with that failure and just get up and deal with it like a real adult is what makes him one of the best characters in Mushoku Tensei. I just can't be happier knowing how big of a role he plays in Rudeus' development and I am just so overjoyed knowing that Paul's legacy up to the last volume of Mushoku Tensei never gets forgotten. Thankfully, after this talk, both father and son walk away with better understanding of things. It was an ugly start to their journeys, but thankfully, both of them walk away as better people. That goes especially for Rudy, as he gains a third objective. Shiron is a good arc and all, but when it comes to profound character impact, it's like, not even close. Sure, he finds Lily and Aisha and gets a nice development with them, but when it comes to true gut-wrenching, long-lasting developments, it doesn't even compare to Orsted's arrival. And speaking of Orsted's arrival, it's time to talk about the second turning point. Rudy and the gang are going through the Red Dragon's mountain range as they arrive at the final stretch of their journey. Rudy is right on the edge of the Ashura Kingdom, which is the safest and the richest region in the entire world, so they shouldn't have any trouble from here on. They encounter the second strongest entity in their world, the Dragon God Orsted, second of the seven great powers and Rudeus' greatest obstacle. Rudy inadvertently walked in on the feud between gods, putting himself, Rouge, and Eris in harm's way. These two know what's up. Their instincts don't even allow them to look at Orsted in the eyes because they know. They know that if they step out of line even a little, everyone dies. So instead of listening to them and taking the fucking hint, Rudy decides to mouth off again and, let's just say, he says the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. Rudy's encounter with Orsted is unfortunately gruesome to say the least, but most importantly, it's entirely Rudy's fault. This isn't the first time when Rudy's brains lagged behind his tongue and caused him to fall into tremendous amount of trouble. In his past life, only reason he was targeted so badly was because he decided to mouth off at the wrong people at the wrong time, and thus, he ended up throwing his life away. Now he made the same mistake a second time and ended up throwing this life away as well. The most unfortunate thing about this entire situation is that it happened not because Rudy forgot something, not because he overlooked a plan, not because he was weak, but simply because he was unlucky. For the first time in Rudy's life, he is struggling and there is no way to fucking fix this. Ruijard got swiftly beaten, Eris is barely breathing, and his lungs are crushed. Unlike any other obstacle they faced, this one is actually insurmountable. So what does Rudy do in the face of certain death? He doesn't fucking back. As Rudy arrives at Death's door, he starts contemplating his life. He knows he still has things to do. So, so many things he still wants to experience and see. But right now, he's not even sure if he can see Eris off to Fitoa. Despite all the mistakes and struggles, he still wants to live a good life. He doesn't want to die in a puddle of his own blood. Not again. This kind of mirrors an event which we'll discuss in the second part of this video, but unlike that person, Rudy actually gets saved. He wakes up, and the hole in his chest is reduced to a mere ripped clothing. He is still in shock, he doesn't know what's going on, but before he can even calm his mind, it is overpowered with the sobbing of Eris. He has never seen Eris like this, he's never seen her so vulnerable. It's such a contrast to her normal, hot-headed, battle-hungry self, it's almost painful. The crimson of her hair masks the blood across her chest, and her face paints a picture of a broken heart. But when Rudy's eyes opened, that broken heart got mended a little. Rudy for the first time touches her not out of some sex-driven desire, but out of guilt, relief, and fear. Throughout these past few years, Rudy and Eris' relationship has come so far. They are unrecognizable from this. The unfortunate encounter with Orsted gave them traumatic experiences they will not be able to leave behind or forget for the rest of their lives. But at the same time, through this fear, through this struggle, they've realized just how much they actually care about each other. They come to understand that as long as they have each other, everything will be fine. Orsted's encounter had an especially deeper and more potent effect on Rudy's compared to Eris. Just a mention of Orsted, even alluding to his existence, reminding Rudy that he walks the same earth as Orsted makes him feel true primal fear. 
Unfortunately, the Sorrow Land doesn't end there, because Rudy left the land of Mushoku Tensei a while back, so he's now entering the land of Re-Zero. Oh, oh god. Rudy and Eris arrive at Fatoa, and there is nothing left. They worked so hard to get back home, but their home is no more. Just like everything else, it got teleported, scattered across the world, and all that remains is a shadow of scars. These three have no direction anymore. Sorrow was stacked on Sorrow, and this puts Rudy and Eris at the lowest points in their lives. They've ultimately fought for nothing. In the end, Rudy doesn't really care much. We see the next day how he literally makes fun of people who were devastated by the disaster. But when it comes to Eris, this has a large impact on her character. She arrives home only to not find her home. Her grandfather and parents are dead. Almost everyone she ever knew is most definitely dead. And worst of all, she can't even stick around for the rehabilitation because some fucking jack-off noble wants to get her as a concubine. If she stays, she'll be dragged through a political marriage. So ultimately, she has lost everyone, except Ghislaine and Rudy. Despite the struggles, despite the dead end they are facing, these three understand that if they work together, they will most definitely get over everything. I'm positive that as long as they stick together, everything can... Rudy, after this moment, is devastated. He's on his last leg. Everything he ever tried to build up and achieve has crumbled on top of him. His homeland is no more, his family is fractured, and he has no friends. Even Eris is gone. The one person he tried to protect all this time. This leaves him with immense psychological trauma and depression, likes of which he just can't move on from. Rudy is confused, angry, devastated, and not a single shred of happiness remains in him. He even falls into that same shut-in nature he desperately tried to overcome. He ultimately circled back to the one thing he hates the most. One thing which is most familiar to him. What Rudy went through is no small ordeal, but you can really see just how easily the development which was in the making for over 10 years can crumble into nothing. You can't change easily. It takes years. It takes years and years of continuous effort to consciously change your deepest habits. And at the end, the fruits of your labor are tested through hardship. Ultimately, if he wasn't kicked out, who knows how long he would have rotted away in there. It's almost like his past traits are still haunting him. It's almost like he ran away from them and didn't actually deal with them. Despite the final few scenes showing us that Rudy has regained his reason to live, regained his motivation to keep moving forward and overcome his past trauma, he hasn't. All of this is a glorified lie. We just see how he views his attitude at the moment. He is acting big because that's the only thing he can do. Rudy is full of regrets and living his new life to the fullest is the least of his concerns. The motivation to go up north is just a fake facade. It's a desperate band-aid which just kicks the problem down the road. But here's the thing, he never cared about his mother to begin with. He always viewed Zenith as a random person he just happened to live with, not his actual family member. He never cared. With all of this in consideration, we gotta ask a singular question. Has Rudius Greyrat actually developed? The short answer is yes, of course he has. He can't even compare the old Rudius to this one. But there's a catch. Majority of Season 1 served as a build-up to Rudius Greyrat's character. But then the ending of Season 1 serves as a deconstruction. We peel back all of those layers which he seemingly incorporated in his character, and we just see what is actually left. The husk. Season 2 is when all of these developments actually cement themselves onto Rudius Greyrat's soul. That is the point where he really changes, to the point where he will never, ever be able to revert back to his past negative traits. Season 2 is the true development of Rudius Greyrat.